if you'd have asked me at the very end, if you'd have put a suitcase, $10,000, a thousand miles down the road and said, go on, just another thousand, I'd have just gone, no. I'm just be. I'm done. At that point where Forrest turns around and he says, I'm pretty tired, I think I'll go home now. I just knew exactly sort of what he felt like. Rob Pope, welcome to the show. Cheers, thanks for having me, man. It's a very, very pleasant reminder to hear that accent while I'm out here in Texas. <laughs> yeah, same as well, man. I hope you, uh, hope you spread the Geordie love over there. When, when I was actually in the States, nobody actually thought I was English, by the way. Most people thought I was Australian. Well, it's just such a strong accent, right? It's not exactly... When people think about Britain, especially Americans, they think about like, pip, pip, tally-ho, what, what, <laughs> cup of tea, governor. And then oh, you God, come in, yeah. fucking hell, all right, mate. What the, fuck, <laughs> what the fuck's going on there, la? <laughs> like, it's not... Well, I was relying on the Scouse acting to get me out of trouble if I ever got into a, if I ever got into some real shit, you know. And it sort of actually almost got me into trouble once, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to that later. Tell you what, a, a funny, um, a funny story about my accent. In 2006, right, I did my first ever Boston marathon, and if anybody's like done a marathon, sort of in the UK or elsewhere in the world, they've not done Boston, you've got to do it. It's like the best. Mile 13. You've run past Wellesley College, which is the biggest all-girl university in like the United States, probably the world. And when you go down it, it's like what it was like being in the Beatles. So everybody's screaming and there's signs up saying, we'll kiss any Mexican guy, we'll kiss any Japanese dude. And I saw one, I, I wasn't going to do a PB, and I saw one who said, we'll kiss any Brit. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to have a bit of that. And I just, I just lent in for a peck and it ended up being something a little bit more. And I just said, I've got to go. And as I ran down the road, I heard her just go, oh, my God, he sounds just like Prince William. <laughs> <laughs> You've never heard Prince William, have you? You're so confused. No, no, no. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Scouse. I understand what you mean when you say that you rely on your accent as another layer of defensive armor, because there is something about the Scouse accent which is essentially weaponized. Like it is, <laughs> it is broadly for the people that are listening from America or elsewhere that don't understand to hear Rob's accent in the UK is to, it's to fear that there's, he's got 10 mates and they're all going to do you in next to the kebab shop. That's kind of <laughs> like, I, for instance, I wouldn't want to work with a scouse psychotherapist talking about my past trauma. <laughs> what would be the American equivalent? Would it be like New Jersey or something like that? Yeah, it's like probably. A, a kind of an aggressive. Um, yeah, it probably would be a New Jersey one, maybe. But that's the thing as well. We're like the friendliest people. Like everybody like sort of comes to Liverpool and then just like they hear the voice and then they're just like, oh my God. And then they just go, where about you go, mate? I'll take you there. Obviously, I'm going there myself. Just come with me. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Fuck, man. So what's your background in running? You mentioned that you did the Boston Marathon. Is is running something that you've done all your life? Yeah, well, I did it at school. Bizarrely, like Liverpool uh, is such a football city. And my school is one of the schools that didn't play footy. So it was cross country or rugby in the winter. And so I did cross country because I was too little. And uh, I did that at school, but when I actually went to university, I switched and played football. Um, did I did a few marathons, but I was only like training in the way that you know the average person would train to do a marathon. You know, if I was doing a forty mile week, I'd be very happy with that. Um, but I moved to Australia for three years in 2012, and I decided to join an athletics club just because I wanted to get a circle of mates. And I didn't think sort of uh, I thought my football days were over anyway, just because I was getting a bit older. And um, I joined this club and it got really weird because I'm naturally competitive to the point sort of which stresses me out a bit. But like I, I much prefer to train rather than race. But when I train, I train really hard as if I'm going to do a race, even if there's not one scheduled. And I, I started getting really quite good. And I ended up getting picked to run for Victoria, the state of Victoria in the Australian uh, Marathon Championships, which is part of the Sydney Marathon. And um, the first mile went really well. And uh, I was running behind this huge fella. Uh, he was actually on telly. He must have been about six foot six. Uh, so that's two meters tall. And like he had these marijuana socks on. And uh, the commentary said, oh, we've got a hometown here out here. And he, he dropped back. And I thought I was going to drop back with him. But I stayed with these lead guys. 
And eventually, I, yeah, I come tenth in the Sydney Marathon, and I go over the line, and the coach from Victoria goes, "Congratulations, Rob, you're Australian champion." And I was just like, "Mate, like, you know I'm English, right?" <laughs> and he goes, "Doesn't matter, mate. You've been here long enough." And I go, okay, uh, I get the get the medal. And I, I literally don't say another word until I get the medal in case someone just said, excuse me, he's not he's not Australian. And I got it and I took it off in the way that often, like, you know, people take off their second place medal because they don't want it. But I was just taking mine off so I could put it in my pocket in case anybody came up and said there'd been a dreadful mistake. And I was going to go, mate, I know I've lost it. <laughs> but I've still got it downstairs. I should have brought it up, but... Um, and it, it got more surreal after that because I'm walking down the streets in Sydney and I get a phone call from the head of Athletics Australia. And he goes, congratulations, Rob. Uh, you know, t- today was a double IWF gold race. And I'm just like, uh, yeah. And he goes, do you know what that means? And I'm like, no. And he goes, because you came in the top 10, mate. It means you've automatically qualified for Rio. And I was just like, what, like, as in like the Olympics? Not like the fizzy drink or the uh, or the kids film, <laughs> and he's um and he says yeah, and I go, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to the Olympics? And he goes, well, no, because there's some other people who are going to try and get the qualifying time, but at the moment only one has got the time, and there's three spaces. So if they don't get the times, would you be prepared to switch nationality? And I was just walking past the tattoo shop as the call happened. And I was thinking about just going in and getting the uh, the Southern Cross done on my arm. But uh, unfortunately, I think three more got the time and I was um, I was fifth and nobody got injured. So I keep meaning to go and get that tattoo, but I'm going to get the Olympic rings. But like at the end, just dot the last two out. <laughs> <laughs> nearly, nearly achieved nearly. the Olympics. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what a, ro- what a great story for the pub, though. Yeah, it's it's not bad. Roll me forward from there, then. You decide to do this rather ridiculous journey across America. Where did the original idea for this come from? Ah, oh, sort of a, the original idea. You know, sort of all the best ideas I think are slightly plagiarized. And um, I read a book uh, by a fellow called Nick Baldock, who sadly isn't with us anymore. And um, he ran across America like in the early 2000s, maybe even in the 90s. And it was just such a great story, the way he sort of painted all these landscapes. I thought, I'm going to do that one day. And I sent him this email in 2006, and it was entitled Forrest Gump 2. Because, of course, everybody who runs across the States, you know, you're going to get the Forrest Gump comparisons. And um, he was super supportive and said, oh, you know, these, this is all what you've got to do. And, you know, there's quite a lot that goes into it. And, I never really had enough time. And it was only actually coming back from Australia. Uh, I, I came back to a job that I thought was going to be brilliant and it ended up being not brilliant. I didn't have any time to run. And at this point, I was slightly harboring, you know, ambitions that I could maybe get to the next Olympics. You know, I thought, well, why not? I've never trained properly before. So let's give it four years. And then uh, never happened. And I thought, I'm not going to get to the Olympics on a three year training cycle. So um i thought let's do this america run let's get it done and then um, the the training sort of um didn't really pick up but the planning did and i um i was looking at routes and i had always had this idea of the forest gun proof and i remember reading an article in a newspaper of a guy who completed it and i thought oh god there's no point doing it now somebody else has done it and then i read the article but he'd only done one of the five crossings he'd gone from santa monica to me and i thought right this is it if, if i'm reading this article and thinking oh wow that that would have been brilliant to have done someone else is reading that article and we've just got to go and we actually looked at when forest started which is september the 15th and this was in march and we were like right six months that's probably enough to think about it and plan and uh, as it happened there was another guy who probably read that article and he was going to go for it as well. So uh, it made it a little bit awkward. <laughs> Did he end up doing it? <laughs> he ended up starting it, but um, like he had some, um, well, basically, I think we both ran into problems in Houston, uh, mission control and all that. So mine was with injury and his with, with logistics. And um, I don't think he, 
fancied the solo crossing so early in it. And so, um, yeah, unfortunately, he couldn't continue because it would have been quite fun to have had a, a little bit of a, a race across the country. But it was just me. So like what did the plan to do it look like? How do you begin to plan running across America five times? Well, my original plan was just the athletic goal. And I just thought if I can do one crossing, then I'll always have a thing to hang my hat on. You know, that's just such a great story. There's only 300 people who've ever like ran across a year and probably like a few more who've like walked across. Um, so I, I thought, where am I going to start? So Greenbow, Alabama doesn't exist. They made it up for the film. So in the book, Forest is from Mobile. So I thought, right, let's start there. And it's actually quite cool because it's only like a marathon or so away from Bayou La Battery, which is where Bubba's from. So I'm already going off course. <laughs> I take a, a little detour down to the down to the sea and I uh, see the shrimp and boats come in. And then it's basically setting a course for Santa Monica. No real goals on the way. I thought I'd love to go through New Orleans. Uh, we had to go through Houston uh, because we were going to be getting an RV there, you know, sort of, and that was the sort of thing. Then on to Austin, uh, which is like still one of my favorite American cities. Went through Texas to El Paso. And so this is just all part of a route to get to Santa Monica. But from there, you know, five times, no one's ever done that. No one has ever liked to have run across America, I think, four times at that point, you know, and sort of, um, so I was just like, right, this is going to go one step beyond. And there was a chap who'd borrowed a map from behind a newsreader, Forrest Gump, and he calculated pretty much an entire route and it made it out to be 15,248 miles. Now, I, I tinkered with that a bit because he'd missed out a couple of waypoints like uh, Glacier National Park up in the north. And um, and I thought, I have to hit at least everything you can find where a scene was in the film. I've got to go there. And so I went down a proper procrastination wormhole of like sort of, a, you know, where are all these cool places? Can I swing by Vegas on the way? Yeah, probably can. <laughs> And then, uh, then the next sort of thing was like, how the dickens are we going to afford this? Because um, they reckon when you've got any sort of expedition like this, you should really plan it at least 18 months out. And by the time we decided we were definitely going to do it, we booked the flights. We had like three months. And so sponsors were going to, you know, touch it with a barge pole. Somebody with, yeah, I'd run a few marathons, but I had no ultra form at all. Um proposing to do something that nobody had ever done in fact there's like an article that says like was his run even physically possible and so is somebody really going to hang the hat with somebody who in all honesty in all likelihood was just going to be a spectacular or even a an, an unspectacular failure because who wants to tie their company's brand to that you know oh this is a guy who went for a run 200 miles later realized he couldn't hack it you know this is my this is my brand and um, so we thought, we'll get to Santa Monica, someone will pick it up. No, nah, that didn't happen. We'll get to New York, someone will pick it up. That didn't happen. And that was the ongoing story. So uh, myself and my partner, we had saved up money for a house. And we thought, right, well, that is at least get us to, you know, California and a, a bit back the other way. Um, and hopefully that sponsor will come, but it never did. And we were thinking about the best way to do it, which was hire an RV. Now you're looking at three grand a month, too expensive. Hire car and motel, still a one-way transaction. So we gambled on buying this old RV, like a proper like sort of Ron Burgundy type special, and then selling at the end to see if we could recoup some of the money. And uh, even though it didn't work out like that, it gave us enough confidence to say, let's do it. And once we had our 30-foot long cruise liner, we had to at least make it to the bloody Pacific, didn't we? <laughs> And that was all the planning. I only had a 90-day visa. I wasn't confident I would go the the whole sort of five crossings. In fact, Nadine was the only person who ever believed that I would. What made you think, given your limited experience at doing ultras, that you would be able to do 15,000 miles? It was the sort of knowledge that people had run across America before. And I've sort of found that with any sort of like sports cycle and training, it takes you about a month to get into it. So I spoke to a couple of people who'd, uh, who'd done it. 
included one guy who's the only guy to have run every London Marathon. He was an invaluable source of experience. And he said, the first three weeks will be the test. If you get through the, the three weeks, you know, that is then basically your setup to do it, at, you know, the pace that you're going to be able to do it at. And then after that, it's a question of hanging on. So the thing is, it didn't really matter to me about getting much beyond Santa Monica. I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to. And if I'd have finished after two and a half legs, would I have been disappointed? Absolutely. But I think I'd have been able to look back at it and just go, I still did quite a bit, you know. I got to Chicago, you know, sort of, uh, that'll do me. Um, but, like, it would have been cool because Forrest didn't set out to run five times across America. It was never his goal. In fact, I'm the only person in the world whose goal it probably was and went out to actually achieve it. Um, he just ran until he was tired. And I figured as long as I get the haircut at the start and then grow the beard, and run till I'm tired. That's that's at least a good tribute. Was the worst part of the entire trip getting that haircut at the beginning, that high and tight thing? <laughs> it was so weird because, like, sort of, I've never had short hair before. Like, sort of, I, even when I was a little kid. So it was 38 degrees in a mobile that day, and I walked out of the barber shop, and my ears were cold. <laughs> I'm just like, what's going on? Um, but it was so funny in the barbershop because they were convinced it was a hidden camera thing. You know, when I went in and showed them a picture of the Fo Forrest Gump thing, uh, dressed up like sort of, uh, you know, not like Forrest Gump at this point, and then like just pointed to a picture on the wall, I believe it was number 24, and the guys like, sort of, uh, like he was just like, his expression was just one of sheer like, mate, are you having me on? He's just like, are you kidding me, man? And of course, I didn't want him to think I was taking the piss because, you know, if I, if I go in there, like, and just like random English dude into this barbershop, you know, I, I, I don't think there's ever been many brawls in a barbershop, but I was probably close, closest to inciting one than, than most people. And uh, he just went, oh, if that's what you want. He sat me down and like, sort of, I swear I could actually hear the, like the chunks of hair hitting the floor. It was just like a thump. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? But if you're going to do something like this, if I'd have run it and like the whole time I was in like perfect, like sort of bespoke sports kit and I just was like, you know, not cutting cutting my uh, hair and like making sure I was clean shaven so, you know, I wasn't getting all sweaty and crusty, I'd have regretted that so much. Why? <laughs> I think it's just like, if you're going to do it, this is, it, it, well, if I succeeded, Will anybody be bonkers enough to try it again? Because it's not as if it's like the 100 metres at the Olympics that is on a four-year cycle. This was a thing. It was it was a dream, but it's also extremely far and extremely difficult logistically to pull off. Like, I still swear, if people said, like, what was the one word that describes how you got through the run? And like people are expecting things like grit, resilience. I just go, look. And there was so much luck involved in every turn. Like, yeah, of course, there was like a lot of like effort that went into it, but just slight missteps here, you know, sort of getting hit by a car in New Jersey, you know, sort of, um, if, if that had been any worse, that would have been it. You know, I tore a quad in a crossing the Mississippi. And like, why was that a quad injury that I could, I could walk through and then run through rather than something that was just like, you know, Look, that's you out for eight weeks. And after that, did you really run continuously? Because that meant a big thing to me. It had to be a continuous thing. The only scupper in that was because I wasn't American. And that's my big advice. If anyone's going to try and do it again, be rich, be American. And then you don't have to come home and, um, and renew your visa. But I console myself with the fact that even though people say, oh, well, you did have a break because you came home, I was just going to, I would have given my hind teeth not to have come home. Because when I did come back to the States, well, it was back to those three weeks of hell every single time because you detrain so quickly on something like that. And I put on so much weight. Um, I was like 10 stone two, I think, at the start. And I think I was 10 stone three when I finished. But when I was home, if I was home for three or four weeks, I would go up to like 11 and a half stone just because I was eating 5,000, 6,000 calories a day on the run. And it took a while for my stomach not to want that. And it was usually just about normal level when I went back to the States. And then I had to work out how to get 5,000 calories in me again. <laughs> Fuck. 
So wh- high level, yeah. what did what did you end up achieving? How long did it take? How far did you go? And what were the records that went along with that? So the the the, the skinny of it was like fifteen thousand six hundred and twenty one miles, give or take. You know, sometimes I'd uh, I'd stop for a wee and then remember to not start me watch. And so at the start. I was so obsessed with doing this right. I would actually run back 400 meters to the point where I'd have my weight and then do it. But at, towards the end, probably just like, I think Forrest was getting a bit sick of it. You know, I'd be like, I, if I was going to cheat, I wouldn't have cheated by 602 meters. Yeah. So on we go. And I uh, didn't have quite the spring of my step at that point. Uh, it was 422 days. So that's an average of 37 miles a day. That's like, roughly a marathon and a half and it, we'll call it marathon and a half because i would end up having to like walk to places and get me food and stuff like that um it was 43 different states but there was probably about 60 65 state crossings um 33 pairs of shoes in, including the nike cortez which i wore as a c- ceremonial thing at the start whenever i reached an ocean um and we talked about boston before i actually did boston marathon uh competitively as part of the run i almost got to the start line but when i tore my quad it put me back by about a week in terms of pace and um so i ran the boston marathon got a lift from new jersey from a local runner and then he came and dropped me back there like a couple of days later and I then ran to Boston and ran the marathon, but with no crowds this time, which was a real surreal moment because you're going, that's the fire station. And this, that, you know, last time there was like, sort of, you know, 6,000 people here. I went past Wellesley College and there were no signs asking no me snogs. to kiss anybody, you know. <laughs> no, no snogs. Well, to be fair, there was none in the competitive marathon um, this time because I had a little bit of a silly um silly idea around mile 11 when i went past that fire station because there was a guy in a manchester united shirt there and i'm a liverpool supporter so i saw that he was heckling some people but in a nice way i thought i'm gonna go over and have some fun here and when i went over i saw he was actually offering people some of his bud light and so i just go past i just go thanks very much mate take the whole bottle and i'm running along mile 11 and i'm drinking away from this beer and there's a sort of unwritten etiquette in um, a marathon runner that if you don't get to an aid station because you're right in the middle of the channel, generally there'll be a runner next to you who'll just go, mate, do you want some of this water? And so my instinct was just to go to the fellow next to me, mate, do you want some of this? And he just, he just looked at me like I had two heads and he was like, no! <laughs> I was like, okay. So I, uh, I drink this beer uh, uh, over the course of the next mile. And um, I'd started right at the back because I got like a late entry. And I thought, oh, what pace have I got to do to get under three hours for this marathon? Because I, I thought to start, right, this is all about preservation. You're doing a much bigger run. Don't be an idiot and run fast in Boston. But then the crowds there, this is the reason why people should do it, like, so good. I was just like, oh, my God, I've, I've got to give it some beans here. And I, I saw what my pace was. and It was going to be just over six-minute miles. I did one. And it felt all right. So I did another one. And I ended up getting in under the three hours. And I um, got interviewed by CBS at the finish line. Fortunately, I didn't have the beer on me. But uh, they knew about it. <laughs> Man, that's taking Scouse Culture International. That's exactly what a Scouser <laughs> should have done. How did you get on with your well, marathon? Well, I nabbed a beer halfway round, and I finished it in under three hours. Exactly. Well, Bud Light's just an isotonic sports drink, really, though, isn't it? Fuel. So- <laughs> everything... Everything is fuel. All right, so you have got this plan in place. You have an understanding that you're going to get yourself from Alabama, where you begin, up to Austin, Texas, or up to Texas to pick up your RV. Who's with you? What's the support team look like, and what's the kit that you take out? So I had a really excellent support crew. I had a driver. I had a crew chief. I had a navigator. I had a psychologist, uh, and... The only issue with that was it was just one person, and that was uh, that was my long-suffering girlfriend Nadine, who took on every role uh, that, that was needed. And um, I don't think she'd ever driven a left-hand drive before, and certainly neither of us had ever driven a thirty-foot left-hand drive on one of the busiest interstate systems in the world. And um, I love the fact that the guy in Houston who was uh, who sold the RV was a guy called Randy Lane which is the most Texan name I've ever heard of your life. He had a huge tash. 
he had a proper like Stetson and stuff like that. And to be fair to him, like there were a few issues with the RV, but you know we were spending like sort of um you know eighteen thousand dollars on on something that would have probably cost about one hundred and fifty thousand when it was new, you know. So we we didn't blame Randy for that, and um yeah, and so Nadis like said it was just so good on the on the run, and it because of course like it was my dream. And I was seeing all these incredible sights. But, of course, a lot of the time she was just sat in the RV and it was hot. It was really hot. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I had a diamond with me. <laughs> it's a team sacrifice across the board. So, all right, you get you get yourself out there. First three weeks, you get running. What were some of the first things that you managed to encounter between on that first leg to get yourself out towards Santa Monica? It's, it's just one of these things where everything was so new to me like uh, i remember like starting like the first day we found a house that looked very much like the gump boarding house and the local tv crew came there and i was dressed in the chinos the check shirt the cat uh, this is the actual cat by the way you see it's a nice pink there but that's the inside of it so that's just the sun that has uh, bleached that so much so it's seen some seen some sights this and then uh, the next day, it turned into a proper, like, sort of, you know, monsoon. And I was running through, like, sort of half high water. But then you just get into proper bayou country, and I was listening to Credence, and I was soundtracking my life. And then uh, got into Mississippi. First of all, I crossed the great state of Alabama. And then got into Mississippi, and I saw a roadkill thing on the road ahead of me, and I thought it was a deer. It was only when I got close to it, it was like a six foot gator. But, you know, basically, so all the bones were there, but then you could see the scales. And uh, I was going to take one of its teeth as like a little thing and, you know, make it to a necklace afterwards. And just as I went down to touch it, a huge flock of birds just scattered. And I just thought, oh, man, there's some bad voodoo about this. I'm leaving that right there, you know. And, um, yes, yeah, so I, I just sweated my way to Texas. And ironically, the first hint of uh, trouble came as we were approaching Houston. Uh, I had a good school pal I've not seen for 20 years, comes out and runs with me for a couple of days. And we're sitting around uh, having lunch. And Nadine just says to me, you are smashing this. She said, you're going to do this so easy. And I was, hey, I was still getting tired at this point, by the way. Um, and I said, we'll say that when I'm about 10 miles from the end. And I got up from this chair and I'd had this um, pain in my uh, in my shin for the last couple of days. And I got up and I heard like this creaking noise. Like, eh? And I just said, out of the chair. And then I carried on walking and I could hear my leg was making a noise. And it was basically my tendon so inflamed within the sheath that it was actually rubbing that much. It was like, it sounded almost like a cricket. And I was just like, oh my God. And then... Um, I did all my Googling and I spoke to a physio in Liverpool and, and he said, this is like an eight week layoff type thing. Um, what can you do in terms of rest? And I said, uh, well, I've got tonight. <laughs> and um, so I spoke to Chris, the guy who'd run across before and he'd looked at all my like sort of Strava data and he said, Rob, you're running too fast. And Nadina told me that as well. But, like, I didn't feel it at all. I was just like, this is great. I'm not out of breath. I'm sweating. But it's because it's, like, 40 degrees. Um, and he said, you just need to start taking walking breaks in the day. And he said, I said, I'm not walking across America. I'm running across America. And he goes, yeah, nobody who runs across America runs the whole way. He said, like, you have to recover on the job because if you don't, your body's, you know, what what you're expected to do, it can't rebuild while you're breaking it down simultaneously. You've got to give it some sort of a chance. And somehow uh, I saw a physio in Houston and I just love the fact that she was called Whitney, you know, and it, like, yeah, it only dawned on me after I'd left. You know, it's like one of these things where you have an argument and then you, you think of the best thing to say in the world. And like, yeah, so Whitney Houston saved my life. Um I got to El Paso, the other side of Texas, and that's when I started just to fall in love with the with the desert, you know. Is it just great? I had one day where I was running down this hill, and um, I was sort of back and forth with two uh, Mexican vaqueros, cowboys, who were on a 60-mile ride that day. And um, we just like like proper road warriors, you know, like we tip our hat to each other as we passed each other. And uh, 
Yeah, like get, getting through Texas was something huge to me because the biggest thing in distance in the UK is probably a Land's End John O'Groats. So for like people listening abroad, that is the very top of Scotland to the very bottom of England. And just to go across Texas is about 50 miles further than that. So I was like, this is this is the achievement. And when I got injured after that, I got uh, Achilles tendonitis in Phoenix. But I didn't care because I just thought, well, I'll tape it up like I tape a shin up. But I've still run across Texas. And that's what gave me the confidence that I wouldn't have been super, you know, lifelong disappointed uh, if I hadn't done the whole thing. You know, I certainly would have had enough to have looked back on. I think I'd have only got a um, upset about it when somebody else did it. I remember um, you got a great podcast about sort of uh, people who achieve a lot and sort of, uh, but they also can tend to be very jealous. Now, I'm just a bit like, no, no, I will be absolutely fine. Apart from when I read it in the paper that someone's done it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't stop that. It's a great source of motivation. Where are you sleeping? Once you've picked up the RV, are you parking up somewhere by the side of the road or finding a truck stop and then just kipping in the RV overnight? Yeah, well, you, you came up with two of the three options there. So the third option would be the campsite. We'd have to do that every three days because you've got like your grey water, which is like your shower water and your, your dishes and things like that. And you've got your black water, which is the other type of water that you need to get rid of from it. And um, so I knew that sort of Nadine was going to be, you know, the one for me for keeps when we are ho both holding a pipe and uh, seeing sort of the previous day's meals uh, disappear in front of us. <laughs> um, yeah, who thought that RV was so glamorous, right? <laughs> um, but they, yeah, sometimes we'd stay at truck stops and um, we, had, we had a hilarious time. Uh, we were in Kingman, Arizona, which is on Route 66, and the unwritten rule of rvs and truck stops is you do not park where trucks should be because it you know they've got to sleep they're doing a job you know and if they if they don't rest they're dangerous and so they're just like you know i couldn't believe there was a bloody trailer there when i arrived so we get to this place and it's empty so we just park up randomly and we've gone to bed about 10 o'clock and we shouldn't get a hammer in on the door and it's this truck driver and i'm just like mate what's the problem and he just goes you're in my spot and I was just like, are they reserved? And he just goes, I just want to park here, move your RV. And I just thought, I am not arguing with the truck driver. And so we moved it over the road. Now, we just filled up with petrol that night. And first of all, it wouldn't start. And we're like, oh, my God. So it's got like an emergency start button, which gives it a massive push. And yeah, it got over the road. And we noticed that the fuel had gone down to zero. And I just thought, this bastard stole our fuel. And I was I was bouncing off the walls. I went over and I was at it in the service. I said, have you got CCTV like in the car park? And you're like, yeah. And I was like, boo, police said, yeah, we've been here. Someone's stolen our fuel. And then so they come around, they take a photo of the fuel gauge. They get access to the CCTV. It's quite late. Um, and then he said, we'll come and uh, see you in the morning. So in the morning, they come and knock and they go, hi, how are you? We're like, great. Because we were a bit worried that this guy was going to come over and do something anyway, you know. And um, so he just says, well, yeah, we just need to, like, you know, move you or something. I can't remember what he did, but he turned the ignition and the fuel needle just goes ding, 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 ding. It was a bloody stuck needle, wasn't it? <laughs> and the thing is, it was so good that that was the copper who'd seen it at MT the night before with the engine running. And I was just like, mate, I'm really sorry. Is this a problem? And he just, like, closes his notebook and he goes, not for me. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> and um, so yeah, truck stops were great generally because I actually I loved the truckies. He was like the only mean one that I think I encountered the whole way. You know, so, and to be honest, he was probably just tired and he didn't want to walk further to the bathroom, so I'll let him off. Um, but then the other places, um, and the team was an expert at finding these. Was it like the the rogue camping? So. It was so great in the desert. It's like really hard to do in California. They don't like you there. Oh, the fourth category is Walmart car parks. You know, so they'll often let uh, the RVs park up there because they know you're going to go in and, and buy some food. But um, we, we'd we spend these nights like in glorious isolation, you know, sort of with no light pollution, just seeing all these stars. And I remember we were only a couple of days after El Paso in New Mexico and um, I found this perfect place on the sat nav and I said, right, I'm going to run to this and I'll see you there in a bit. And when I get there, there's a border patrol 
uh, car parked up there. And I'm just like, oh, no, he's so not going to let us camp here. So I knocked on the window. And he had so much armor on him. And he was so tooled up. And he was little and squat. He looked like a turtle. And so, like, I was having to, like, sort of stifle me chuckles. And I said, mate, do you um, mind if we, like, park there and sleep in overnight? And he said, no, that's fine. So we'll keep an eye out for you. Like, so if you hear anything in the night, just make sure your doors are locked. And I was just like, because we're right by the Mexican border. So it's like, you know, real big patrol area. And we're in this place and we're like, what do we do? There's nothing around here to do. And we realized that we were in an RV in New Mexico and we got Breaking Bad on DVD. And so we literally, we watched, we'd never seen any of it. So we watched the first series of it and we were like, this is amazing. You know, sort of like life imitating art so much. And um, yeah, it was just the, the whole sort of culture of America, like permeated the whole run. And to have something completely random like that, like I never thought part of the culture that I would experience would be like sort of, you know, all about gangsters and meth dealing. You know? <laughs> You're feeling like your own version yeah. of Heis- the, the Scouse Heisenberg running across Texas and New Mexico. <laughs> well, that's what I thought was going to be the trouble after that, you know, because uh, eventually we'd see these Border Patrol people and they'd, they'd always stop and check if I was OK, you know. And I was always expecting a bit of an extra question, like, you know, like, you seen anybody around here? We'd be like, no, no, just me and vultures. <laughs> <laughs> what was your recovery like? So you're running, how many hours a day are you typically running? You said you're doing about a marathon and a half, so about 37, 37 miles a day on yeah. average. What's that? You're getting up at 8 a.m. Take me through a, a typical day. Yeah, I get up about 8. Um, and so like, I'm not a morning person at all. I'm desperately trying to become it because I just know my life would be so much better if I could get myself up reliably. That, that's my mission. That's my New Year's resolution for 22. I'm going to try and get a morning morning routine sorted. And I'd, I'd uh, usually have something like a protein shake before I go out the, uh, the door. And eventually I'd actually start throwing, you know, the sachets of oats. I'd just throw one of those in and, like, just swirl it around and just get it in. Um, I wouldn't take any water with me on the first run. Because I, yeah, I was probably overhydrated overnight. Get to the uh, do about like eight, nine, ten miles. Have my second breakfast, which is usually something pretty filthy, uh, like donuts or like Twix. <laughs> Elite <laughs> like, nutrition, uh, then. I, I, exactly, it's real top notch stuff. And um, I actually call the gas station nutrition because it's just literally what we get in the gas stations and Dollar Generals because you know she's fantastic. Um, I do that. Then we go through to lunch. Uh, and I had this set routine every single day, apart from the odd time we go to like a fast food joint. I'd have ham salad and Catalina dressing sandwiches. Now, I'd never even heard of Catalina dressing before I was in the States. It's like this sort of almost like a red creamy vinaigrette. Um, and it's so nice. Um, and I just thought, I'm having this every day for my lunch. It's going to be a thing that I look forward to, part of the routine. Um, and yet, like, pineapple Fanta as well was was my lunchtime drink, you know. And so it was, a, it was so forest in its way. You can imagine that that's the sort of thing that forest would do. Um, and then I'd head out, you know. So generally, if I could have, like, sort of three runs before lunch and a marathon in the bag, that'd be great. And then I tend to do like about another, you know, eight or nine miles after that, and then a, sh- a shorter one. But quite often it was dictated to where the uh, our resting place was that night because if we were at an RV park after 32 miles, I would much rather start from where we were in the morning rather than go eight miles past or eight miles shy. Uh, so I'd sometimes I'd go longer uh, because then you'd have to go up in the morning, you'd have to drive back to the line, you'd draw in the sand or the bowls that you put on the floor, you know, to make sure you did the place. And I'd always go about 10 metres back just in case it moved in the wind, you know, and um, and then off we go. And um, even, even a meal was usually like microwave or burritos, Idaho instant mash, you know. God, if I didn't get a sponsorship deal off them, I wouldn't get a sponsorship deal off anyone. Like, so I lived off that stuff. Um, and then, yeah, just pretty much whatever I'd take on the run, sometimes a handful of gummy bears. And, yeah, it changed later on, sort of when I was solo. That was very much more a teenage boy left in a house with a with a fistful of dollars and he can eat what he wants. <laughs> Fuck, man. And what about recovery? Were you doing foam rolling? Were you doing any sort of active recovery during the day, any stretching routines, or was it just sleep? Yeah, a lot of sleep. I prided myself on getting 
eight hours every night. You know, so it was a rare occasion when I, when I uh, didn't. And uh, I would do some stretching always at the end of the day, but the, the amount of stretching I did was clearly not adequate because the second half of the run, I was basically, uh, I wasn't fighting fires that were started. There was just a fire. And I was just having to stop it going out of control because everything was so tight, you know, sort of, uh, in my pelvis and my glutes, because I just wasn't using these muscles. And they just turned into like fibrous straps whose only function was to like trap my sciatic nerve. And, uh, you know, I'd be running down the road sometimes and I would literally just either give out a scream because of like a massive jolt of pain going down my leg or I'd actually almost fall over because without any pain. My leg would just collapse under me. Not tired. It would just be like, sorry, no nerve impulses have gone to your muscle this time. So <laughs> down you go, son. What was the longest that you ran in a day? It wasn't actually that spectacular. Like sort of, uh, some, some real ultra runners going, oh, my God, like so this guy must be a maniac, must be doing like, you know, 120 mile days. It was uh, 63 miles um, in Colorado. Everyone just goes, oh, my God, that's up mountains. Well, I was in the uh, the east of Colorado, which is super flat and it's, and it's super gorgeous as well. It's like late autumn. And I was trying to get to this place called New Rhema that night. Um, and I knew that there was a cafe there that like shut about six o'clock. And I really enjoyed my breaks during the day. And I'd speak to people. Sometimes I'd just go, it's such a lovely place. I'm just going to sit here for an hour and watch the world go by. And I realized I wasn't going to get there for the cafe. And it was such a small town. There was not going to be anywhere that I could ask anyone to stay. No one on couch surfing. But the post office lobbies in the States uh, are open 24 hours. Uh, it's because people can just like go and pick up the mail whenever whenever they do, you know, because they work so hard over there. And um, I thought, right, I'm going to go and stay there. But I get to this new rain and it's pitch black dark. And I think, I'm just going to try this cafe. You never know. And I go there and there's a light on. I think, oh, this is going to be so good. I had like a half a subway left for me dinner. So I wasn't bothered about dinner, but I was just hoping that somebody there was going to be able to put us up. And I opened the door and it wasn't just a cafe. It was a bar. And I was like, oh, yes. And uh, I go in through the door and uh, this guy, a fellow called Jeff Stelter, who's the loudest guy I think I'll ever meet in my life. He goes, Oh my sweet Jesus, Forrest Gump's here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and I just go, all right, mate. All right. I just sit down at the bar and he goes, what's your name? And I go, oh, hey, Rob. And he goes, Rob's here, everybody. Rob, what are you drinking, Rob? And so I think I got bought about five beers. And then I said, oh, guys, I'm going to have to make a move. I've got to go and like, do more running tomorrow. And so they're like, where are you staying? And I was like, in the post office lobby. And they were like, no way, you're coming back to ours. And so they were like so they're oil drivers. And so they had a trailer and they took us back to the trailer, a few more beers. They offered me uh, bulls, testicles, prairie oysters. And I was just like, I'm, I'm going to pass on them, man. I need my protein. but uh... Not that badly. <laughs> exactly. And so they went, oh, you need protein. And they just gave me a tub of protein powder for the next day. And uh and that was just great. And then the next day, I think we did like 55 miles as well. And you know, at the end, I, I I could string together like sort of you know ten days of fifty miles and and it not even be a problem. It'd just be like sort of a normal day at work, which sounds like almost as if I'm being like you know like cocky about some superhuman feat, but it, that is just what the body is able to do. You know, sort of I wasn't unique. If I was unique, imagine the chances of the one guy who could do it being the guy who decides to do it, it's just not going to happen, you know? And so it does show that the limits that we perceive to be there are only perceived. That's you know, really, to a point, obviously. Th that's really interesting about how adaptable we are. So I've got a buddy, Will Googe, who just ran, yeah. you know, Will, have you been following his 4830? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, man. So for the people that don't know, Will ran 48 marathons in 30 days. For his mum as well. For his mum. Yeah, I think it was Macmillan Cancer that he did it in yeah. collaboration with. And was it all 48 counties in the UK, yes. I think? Yeah, exactly. so he ran all 48 yeah. counties, 48 marathons in 30 days. One interesting thing that he talked about, he did a little bit of post-run analysis on his running style and his stride. And he has a very short stride relatively quick turnover but it's a bit of a shuffle it's kind of like a little <laughs> like little steps he's not really doing much um did you notice that your 
running form cadence at all did you twist that and change that as the run progressed did you find a, a rhythm that was appropriate for you yeah I, I think we sort of did and that's actually one of the uh, the, the real niche things I know know about the films so that seven minute slice of movie history where Forrest does his run you see him like sort of round that corner in Greenbow um and he's like you know he's upright he's you know so he's got a lovely sort of you know sort of choppy cadence but he's got a great stride length and then you still see him doing that like sort of midway through uh you know glacier national park but when it gets to the, the likes of sort of arizona and then on to utah it's such a shuffle and for me like i i try to have a a, a low carriage basically because if you are sort of you know not going up and down then there's going to be less bang 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 but the difficulty about trying to alter your gait is you're opening yourself up to injury because you know i'd run for 38 years and so um well probably 36 i don't think i was running when i was born like <laughs> um maybe you know I, I wish you could have asked me more and um so i was um trying to avoid this impact but then of course i was probably irritating my hip flexors from a really early stage and then later i had to alter my gait because i had this like awful awful pain and so like for the last five thousand miles or so my left leg would hurt with virtually every foot strike and i was taking sixty thousand steps on an average day and sometimes my right would be upset as well because it'd been doing some extra work for the leg so sometimes in a day I was going to get these 60,000 jolts of pain. And it, to be honest, it became noise. You know, so it wasn't really, you know, sort of like sort of stabbing pain. It was just out, 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 out. And you would, yeah, you'd tail your gait to it. But um, if you'd have asked me at the very end, you know, if you'd have put a suitcase, $10,000, 1,000 miles down the road and said, go on, just another 1,000, I'd have just gone, no, I'm just be, I'm done. You know, so at that point, like where Forrest turns around and he says, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. I, I just knew exactly sort of what he felt like. <laughs> what was the darkest place that you got to psychologically throughout the run? There was the intense one was in Houston when that creak happened in my, in my shin. And um, I got to a gas station. And a uh, lady asked what I was doing. So obviously it wasn't dressed like the, the normal um, and I told, I gave her one of my handwritten cards with my social media details on, uh, which is run, rob, la, run, if anyone wants to follow. <laughs> I, uh, handed, um, that last one out and I realized it's probably the last one I'm ever going to write. And that was literally like, a lightning bolt to my like tear ducts. And I just sobbed, like, not like a little, you know, a little heavy breathing. This was full on blubbing. And so the lady came out from beyond the counter, gave me a huge hug. A co-worker came out, did the same. I went over the road and cried for about another half hour before I got on with it. But that was like an acute thing. And then once I got through Texas, I don't think I was, uh, I, I wasn't immune to that sort of thing, but it would have took something pretty biblical to have got me there. The rest of it then was just the worry, you know, because I had this, uh, the worry of injury being possible, but the financial worry was always there. It was just like I did, I, I couldn't check the balance. I would just basically put my card in the thing and just go worked X. Hope for the you best. Know, and keep up, keep yeah, exactly. And uh, it happened once where I did that in a motel, and they said, "Oh, I'm sorry, it's been declined." And I was just like, "Oh no, no, I'm pretty certain I'm actually all right." And I looked in, and it was like thirty six dollars, and that's all I had. I was, you know, maxed on my overdraft at home as well, and I was in the middle of nowhere. And again, another example of like sort of bars saving my life. I went and just sat down in the local one and figured, well, I'm going to camp somewhere tonight. Uh, I'll go and grab a pint. Of course, I didn't pay for that pint. And the bartender said, where are you staying? Yeah. She took me back to hers and she had a couch in the garage. And then I left the next morning to a really uh, nice note from a guy that I didn't even meet that night. And he just said, I just find it amazing what you're doing. Thank you so much for like staying in our house. And so... I was just like, wow, if this kind of thing happens, I've got a chance of making it. So I worried less about the money kind of things. But the darkest I ever got, it wasn't really dark so, so much. It was more of a, a resignation. And I came home uh, at the end of my fourth crossing. I managed to uh, hit the uh, the Atlantic 
for the final time the day before I was due to fly home for my visa. And uh, I'd got some huge news from my girlfriend. She came back out uh, when I went home in the summer. And um, we found out when we were in Minnesota in a tiny little place called Fergus Falls uh, that I was going to be a dad. And, uh, I don't know how you so had the energy in you. When you're doing a marathon and a half a day, how have you got energy left to pump on a night time? Well, th- th- this was on, on a, my trip back to the UK in the summer. And so I, I came back for like three weeks sort of, uh, after I got to Chicago. And uh, we went to see Phil Collins. I'm not being funny. I reckon there were a lot of babies made the night after that. You know? <laughs> 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 yeah, I, sh- I should have actually. It's a shame sort of, that B wasn't a boy. We maybe would have had Phil as a middle name, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or Fergus. Exactly. Well, yeah, that actually was seriously debated, you know. Um, I wanted to um, call him if it was a he, uh, Alexander Douglas, because I got uh, massively obsessed about Scotland on one day when I was running in Idaho because it was like Scotland on steroids. And then um, I went back and I told Nadine that I uh, I think we should call the boy Alexander Douglas. And, and she was just like, no, not a chance. And I was just like, oh, OK. OK. And I said, I am, name- I am naming the boy, though. And she was like, no, you're not. I've, I've got the name sorted. And I said, what am I meant to do? And then she told me um, that she was going to name our girl B, like B-E-E. And, of course, that wasn't what I'd been thinking of at all. And so I was just like, OK. Uh, but now I obviously love it. But um, the run changed after that because I, despite injury, despite, you know, sort of worries with traffic, despite running through supposedly rough areas, which were always fine, as they always are, unless you're doing something stupid in the middle of the night, you know, it's just normal people who live there and everybody was super kind. Um, I felt bomb proof, you know, I had a few near death experiences, but yeah, it wasn't fussed. Uh, but after that then, it was like if a car got too close to me, I was like, you know, I, I had this massive sense of my own mortality. And um, then, of course, when we got to San Francisco, uh, which is closing out the third leg, Nadine had to go home, A, because we had no more money left. And um, she just needed to go and prepare. And, of course, she couldn't fly so late. So the fourth leg, which is one that I, I call the middle child of the run because there weren't many exciting venues that I was going to hit. It turned out there was some of the absolute best moments of the, of the whole trip on this one. But I wasn't excited about it. I knew winter was coming. I didn't have Nadine there anymore. And she was now having to prepare for this baby. And so I go home and, um, you know, in, in December and she's just looking like stunning, you know, the big old bump on her, you know, and um, yeah, just so beautiful. And. I spoke to a mate about the fifth leg and I was like planning the, oh yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And he's just like, you don't want to go back, do you? And I just said, no, not really, mate. And, uh, but I didn't know why there was the obvious answer. And, um, I was thinking, oh, cause I was injured. Uh, I had no money. It was still going to be cold. In fact, it was going to be more winter when I went back. Cause I thought it was going to be nice and uh, warm in Alabama in, in uh, January, but no, it got down to minus 19. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was pretty frisky. And on one day when it wasn't so cold in Alabama, I was lying um, on my back. I'd just crossed into Mississippi, actually, and it was a lovely sunny day, and I just had this eureka moment. And I realized that the reason why I'd been so upset the whole thing was because I knew that the finish would mean nothing to me because Nadine and B weren't going to be able to be there, you know. And so I'd be having this amazing adventure. I would finish it, and then in future years, like sort of, I would be sat there around the dinner table telling everybody about how amazing it was. And Nadine had sacrificed, like, you know, so much of her time. She was with me for, like, about 7,000 or 7,500 of the 15,500 miles. And I'd be like, oh, it would have been great if you were at the end. And I just thought, well, why just not have her there at the end? And there was no way she could come out on the schedule I was on um, because I was, like, you know, scheduled to finish, I think, on the – 18th or 17th of March and B was due on the 27th I was cutting it fine as it was you know she was early I did say to her I said if there's so much of a rumble wherever I am I will be on a plane and I will be home within 24 hours I don't care what it costs you know so <laughs> you know I'll rob a gas station or something I'll, use, I'll get that accent out you know actually I'll just use my charm I'll use my charm and then someone will buy me a flight and um 
so that never happens. And what I just said I'm going to do is like, right, let's focus. I'm going to go and see, first of all, see if I can get a passport for a very young baby. And then I knew I could. And so I called up Nadine and I said, if I come home before the birth, would you consider coming out almost as soon as we physically can to uh, to the finish? And she was just like, is that possible? Could you get a passport? And I went, yep, yeah, yeah, I've already researched that. <laughs> and, uh, so I decided to get my foot down and do the distance that I always intended to do, the 15,248 miles, and get to a really cool landmark break off with a significant distance still to go to Monument Valley and come back. And then basically we're going to have like a lap of honor, you know, the three of us. And um, I finished at Twin Arrows, which is a point in the film where Forrest gets the yellow T-shirt and does the have a nice day. And it was such a poignant place to be because it's like uh, it's in ruins now. You know, so you still got huge giant arrows sticking into the earth, but it was just, yeah. And I looked around me, I completed my miles and I just went home to become a dad and um, kept myself busy. It wasn't quite on a wills rate, but I did do uh, three marathons in three weeks, uh, under three hours as well. And uh, I managed to do the last one in a world record for the fastest film character ever to complete a marathon. <laughs> you, you probably guess who it was, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we flew out the very next day from London. Um, B was, I think, three and a half weeks old, and we flew into Vegas. We drove back out to Flagstaff, got to Twin Arrows, and there was 200 miles left on the clock. And so we had five days to bash that out in. Man, that's so amazing. <laughs> the, so the fascinating thing there for me is that there's a degree when you're being a pioneer or an explorer. Um, the liberation that you have where you have nothing to worry about dying for was uh, what gave you the degrees of freedom to feel comfortable. But yeah. as soon as you know that you're going to be a father, that changes your own sense of life and death and mortality and why you're doing things. And to see that, um, to have a sample of before, during and after and be able to look at your own psychology and say, I was a person that was carefree, bulletproof, didn't feel like anything was going to hurt me. And then watch that transform as you realize that there is now something bigger and greater than you that shares your genetics that you need to look after. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a fast forward version of life. Because you know, uh, when you like you you're stuck behind a car that's going really slowly and you overtake it. It's like sort of, you know, like one of the more senior members of the population. And you think they're probably just thinking life is so precious. I ain't going to be bombing through this red light. I'm not going to be sort of undertaking somebody I'm getting through today. And like, so sort of, I'm going to see my grandkids and everything. I had this like thing, just like fast forward it. It was, you know, the whole year was well year and a half was like compacted down almost into like into a movie of sorts and you know it had a very spectacular end and it had its trials and tribulations but there was a huge amount of you know people always say like what did you learn about yourself um my answer to that are generally fairly corny as you would imagine in terms of like, you know, that I could achieve something like very dramatic and, you know, that I was, you know, able to do this huge thing. But that's not the interesting answer. It was more what I just learned about life and the fact that, you know, sort of how precious it is and the fact that I, I wasn't caring that I got cleared, cleared out by a truck in Tennessee or something like that. It'd be like, but it's for these people that I'm, I'm leaving, you know. And uh, maybe that's the sort of thing, you know, and maybe that's that sense of collectiveness is what we need now and why everything seems to be going to shit so much because quite often in the media, they're trying to take away that collective and make everybody either, you know, bipartisan or, you know, sort of just at each other's throats. Like, you know, talking about the partisan thing, sort of when I was running the States, it was the first leg was surrounding the build up to the Trump election. And we actually watched that, um, the election night in a saloon in Tombstone, Arizona, the site of the gunfight of the OK Corral, which I only found out afterwards. Um, 
took place at a range of six foot. You know, when you think about a gunfight, I imagine people like behind barrels and across the street. This all took place over six foot, you know, and of course, maybe not quite the same range, but the big fight was happening in Washington. And yeah, and the, the country was very, you know, and the, I don't even think they were necessarily there for their respective representatives. It was teams. It was red, blue, Republican, Dem. And there was so, and the, the media was just like, so you're either with us or you're against us. It was not like, oh, well, they've actually got really, really good policy, but uh, we're going to make a compromise. But the, 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 what I found on the ground was it wasn't like that. It just wasn't, you know. So, of course, you'd have people who you'd speak to and you'd know that they were a classic Republican, but they didn't hate Democrats. And it was the same as the other way around. Like, sort of people like in the cities weren't going, oh, like, so Trump voters are idiots, you know. But you'd see that on the news. And, like, you're like, where are they finding these people? Because I'm not encountering them on the road. And I just found, like, a lot of very, very kind people. And not just kindness towards me, because, of course, I was going to receive kindness because I was doing a mad thing. But then you'd hear about, like, something they would do where they're part of a church group or, like, sort of, I met this guy uh, in upstate New York who um, organises, like, a group by fellas, for fellas. But it's not like, yeah, guns, hunting, women, politics. It's just like, oh, does anyone know how to fix this truck? And every year they organise a huge collection, break into someone's house and, like, so we'll replace somebody's fridge because, you know, it's like bust. Or like one that really got me, and I just I keep always thinking about it was a lady sort of who like lost her husband, and of course that was with the job, the healthcare, the truck, and they just went and they clubbed together and they just bought this lady a car so she could get to work and drive the kids around. I just thought this is brilliant, and I I don't even know what politics Billy was. So there, there you go. Talk to Billy me about the near death experiences. What were they? <laughs> oh god man like sort of uh, do, you, do you want animal vegetable or mineral uh, <laughs> um all kinds of things well sort of um from being chased down by a bull moose in idaho and i, I literally pinned myself against a tree and it ducked into the bushes about five foot before uh it literally it was chased by a cyclist you see and just completely startled i was about 200 meters behind it and then the advice is to hide behind a tree because I got really bad eyesight. So I tried to do that and I couldn't because it was like full of thorn bushes. So I basically just strapped myself to the front of this tree, closed my eyes, it was about 30 foot away. And then I heard this crash of branches, which I thought was it disappearing into, uh, you know, well, so it disappearing into me, but it was actually going down into a river. And I was just like, oh my God. And that was my Scotland day. And uh, so I put the proclaimers on after that and like sort of I've never heard sweeter music in my life, you know. <laughs> um, but then, of course, one of the things I've mentioned before was like the cars. Um, you know, I heard when I was running, there was a chap in Ohio uh, called Nick Ashill who'd actually been cleaned out by a hit and run driver. And the only reason he survived and they found him is that he was on the phone to his wife at the time and the fellow had actually swerved across the road to get him. Um, and I punctured his lung, broke his pelvis, internal injuries, everything like that. And uh, he's uh, he's fit now and he's going to go back and he's going to complete that crossing. So I had a few things like that and I was just sort of thinking, was that a deliberate swerve? It probably wasn't. It was probably a phone distraction. And the biggest example of that was I had when I was in Tennessee and a huge 18 wheel rig just jackknifed in front of me. And I was standing there, I was pushing my stroller at this point because I was solo and so this stroller carried all my belongings. I would face oncoming traffic, so I was on the left-hand side of the road there. And I was just trundled along, see this truck, and then suddenly it just starts screaming. It bends double, and like you could see the steam coming up from its wheels. And I'm just stood there looking at it. I'm not scared. I'm not seeing my life flash before my eyes. I just think, that's going to make me nice. And, um, and it would have done because I was just frozen to the spot. And it stopped about 30 foot shy of me, you know. And so uh, the guy just sort of looked up from like his wheel. And I was just like, mate, <laughs> you know, we're both pretty lucky boys because, um, yeah, I think he was on his phone. And, um, yeah, man, like Highway 190 in uh, in Baton Rouge and um, crossing the Mississippi for the first time. It should have been a celebration, but there was no sidewalk, no shoulder. 
just four lanes of traffic and a 200 foot drop to the Mississippi. So uh, I, I, I knew this in advance, but I didn't want to do another 30 miles. I thought it's only a mile. How bad can it be? You know, sort of, uh, we'll, we'll all go through a worse mile, probably metaphorically or lit- literally in our lives. So I get to the point where the uh, where the shoulder disappears into a point and I get my MP3 player out, engage Guns N' Roses, welcome to the jungle, put that on. And as soon as, like, you know, like the lyrics kick in, I go and I go across this bridge in, like, sort of 5.43 and the line comes out at the end. You know where you are, baby? You're in the jungle. You're going to die. <laughs> and, uh, I did, you know, I've got some excellent YouTube footage of it, though, and you'll see that I came pretty close. <laughs> But um, the the closest I actually came to genuine death was um, I was just crossing from upstate New York into Pennsylvania. And I saw this guy shirtless, must have weighed about, I don't know, 250, 300 pounds, maybe skinhead tattoos everywhere and um, really rural. And he's got this like trash bag in his hand and he throws it across his garden. And I'm like, uh, it's a bit weird. Why would you do that? You know, he's not throwing it in the bin. He's just throwing it across his garden and uh, or yard. And he just walks up to this bag. And as he's there, I see the bag move and I realize it's got legs. And I thought, oh, my God, like he's just that's his dog. What do, what do I say? Do, do I say something? I was just like stood there watching him as well. Like, sort of, you know, I don't know, 100 feet away. And I thought, no, if I say something, I'm dead. And uh, but he just strides over and just kicks it, like full punts it in the belly. And the dog lifts off the floor. You know, and this is like, you know, 10 kilo, 15 kilo dog lifts off the floor, the force he puts through it. And that is when I did engage my scary scouse voice. And um, if you listen to the audio book, I don't think I could actually ever reprise it with such fury as I did on that day. But I gave it a really good go in the audio book. We even had to bleep things out because I went over the top. And um, I just, as soon as I said it, I just thought that was the stupidest thing you've just done in, in the history of the world. And I thought, let's just hope that he realises that he was out of order and he doesn't sound scary. And he just goes, what did you say? And I just said, oh, my God. I thought, I can't back down now. So I went for it again. And then uh, he, he just starts walking over and I get me thrown out. So I try to take a photo of him, but it doesn't work. And I go, mate, I'm just taking a photo of you. One more step and I'm calling the police. And so he doesn't just take one more step. He just starts running towards me with this dog wagging its tail next to him as, as it bloody would. So I'm just like, right, I've got to go in. I'm pushing me stroller, thanking God that it was a flat road, you know. And we go about 250 metres and I realise he's not catching me. And so I sort of think, what do I do here? Like, do I say something else to him? Like, mate, let's just forget about this. And I thought, <laughs> just, no, in, no. just in case I'm, you didn't know, mate, I've done 10,000 miles. So if you want to keep going yeah. between the two of us, my cardio is <laughs> going to eat you alive. Well, well, I might have actually slowed down a little bit to see if he was going to carry on giving up, giving the chase. And so, because I wanted him to get as far away from his house as possible, because I just thought, oh my God, if he, if he goes back and gets a gun. And then, so he eventually bends double. But then he turns around and runs back to his house. He doesn't walk back. He was so tired. He had to like, you know, put his hands on his knees and breathe. But then he runs back to his house and he didn't look the sort to have uh, to be doing a nice little sort of a uh, dinner for, for the local church group on his stove. And so I just thought he's going to go and get his truck. He's going to go and get his gun. And so I'm literally steaming down this road knowing that he probably wouldn't have come the whole way across the road to clean me out. But every car and truck that go past me, I'm just like looking at that skinhead guy, skinhead guy, skinhead guy. And I eventually get to this like sort of, uh, you know, place and just like sit down. And like, so I think I drank so many cans of Coke just because I needed like the sugar in me and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And um, I took a screen grab of where it was on the map and sent Nadine a message saying, if, you don't hear from me within the next 12 hours. You have to direct the police to this point uh, because they probably will find a body or at least some evidence of where the trail is going to begin there. And she was just like, what's this about? What's this about? And I just sent that and I ran into an area where there was no mobile reception. So that was like it, you know, and so it was about three or four hours before I could get another message back to her. Your missus (laughs) is an absolute saint. 
the other, this is a sort of thing. Like, so I've written my story down, and everyone's just going to go, "When's Nad's writing her book?" And I keep telling her to do, you know, so she's got some tales, you know. <laughs> Fucking hell! So what happened with this pram after a while? Your missus had to go back to the UK, which meant did the RV go part way through? And then what the what were you doing yeah. with the pram? Well, we went we went to we we doubled back and we went to Tennessee, and she was flying back from Nashville. And so um, we put the RV into storage in Cookville. It was actually quite weird because um, I tore my quad when I was uh, going across the Mississippi for the second time. And I ended up like literally uh, the last half of that day I was in Memphis and I couldn't run. I was walking in Memphis, man. And the irony of that was not lost on me. And we parked up in this mobile home place for two days. And I woke up the next morning because knew my leg was sore, but I wasn't like, oh, I've me quads. I was just like, yeah, I've got a little bit of a pull. And I woke up the next morning and it was almost as if like sort of someone had like stuffed uh, like an orange underneath, underneath the skin. It was that swollen. But then I put my finger in it and it was just like, oh, no. And it just went back really slowly. And I just went, I've torn this. And I um, walked to like the little wash block, which is like about, you know, 30 metres away, and I just couldn't. I had to hop after about 10 metres. I had to hop, came back, and I said, we're not going anywhere today, and that happened the next day. And then I think Nadine was due to fly back in about three days' time, and I said, listen, I'm just going to go to the start today. If I can't walk, you know, like a good distance, then I'll just come back with you, and this is it. This is our – I'm pretty tired. I'm pretty torn. I think I'll go home now. And so um, we knew that she was going. Um, so I, I had some preparation for being solo. It was actually a pram that I bought in Australia because I thought I might run across Australia. And that never happened. In fact, the first time I ever set this thing up and pushed it was in that mobile home park. And um, I knew in four days' time, not only was I going to be having to get from A to B with a with a torn quad, I was also going to be pushing a sled effectively, you know, and so just like, this is not good for a quad. And, um, yeah, so I managed to do 27 miles that day, 33 miles the next day. Uh, this is walking. And then I'll gradually reintroduce the uh, the runs and stuff. When we got to Jackson, uh, we got like a, a Greyhound uh, to Nashville. Oh, so actually we drove the, the, uh, the RV to Nashville and then we put it in storage just down the road. I got the Greyhound back to Jackson where I'd finished running and it was just such a, I, I felt like I was in a Bruce Springsteen song because I'd just come out. I didn't have my guitar, but I had this stroller folded up and I just like put it together and then uh, that was it. I had a hold all with all my stuff in, you know, spare shoes underneath, water container on the front um, and a wing and a prayer. <laughs> How long did you run pushing a pram in front of you for? 8,000 miles. 8,000? Yeah. And it, was it pink? I, Did I see a photo of it and it's pink? Oh, no, it's blue. It's oh, blue. right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a new one, though, that is, uh, which I which I call in Red 5. I called the old one um, Pram Solo because I was looking like Chewbacca. Uh, and so I thought I'd continue the Star Wars theme with my new one because, um, well, I, I pushed Pram Solo all the way from Jackson, Tennessee, up to Maine to complete my second crossing and then to Chicago. Then from Chicago, I went home for a bit, came back and pushed it up to uh, Minneapolis. And that's when Nadine same, came back out. This same pram? Yeah, yeah. I did change the tyres in Chicago, though. I think it had three or four punctures at that point. Uh, <laughs> a good bit of kit to have survived going across America twice. Oh, it's amazing, you know. And um, we, we had the RV all the way across the north down to San Francisco. And a friend of mine, Olivia, took over in um, San Fran. But we'd only got like, you know, two thirds of the way through Nevada. And this dude who is 90 year old, hey, obviously not fearing for his life, this guy, because he was doing about 100 miles an hour when he undertook Olivia and slammed into a driver's side door, like totaling the RV. And so I had Pam Solo still, but I was not set up for that. And I thought I was going to get RV cover to get me down through Nebraska. And, you know, and then. I mean, relatively southern states, and I thought it's not going to be that cold. But then suddenly, Olivia is just like, "I'll sort this out," and I'm like, "No, I can't leave you to do that." But she was just like, "Listen, I don't want to be holed up in a hotel room with you, like like a caged bear, you know, sort of like you know walking around." So just go, we'll sort this out. And so 
like a few days later, I was in Utah going across the uh, the Bonneville Salt Flats, which is where they do all the speed records. And uh, there was one point where there was literally nothing, like no services, no place to get water for like 70 miles. Um, the hot dog at the end of that tasted pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, then, then I went all the way across to South Carolina. It was still with Pram Solo. And then I went as far as, um, well, just after the, the exact midpoint in Route 66 um, in Adrian, Texas, uh, I went, I think I did a marathon past that because I'd been laid up in, a, in the motel room in Adrian for five days, the longest layup I had in the whole trip. And it wasn't with injury. Uh, it was with a dodgy hot dog. And I uh, I had food poisoning. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Six kilos, five days. <laughs> Shit the bed, literally. What about literally. temperature? So you've talked about you've talked about in, enduring some pretty crazy weather. Was there any extreme winds, heats, colds? Yeah, like so I was quite lucky sometimes. Like uh, I would have a massive, massive tailwind, and I love, uh, I love headwinds normally when I'm doing training because it's just a bit like it's like free hill training, you know. Especially in Liverpool, which is pretty flat. But when I had Pram Solo, it's occasionally like sort of um, pushing like a sail into yep. the wind, you know. Yep. And sometimes you'd literally just have to stop and go. I'll oh, just wait for this gust to finish, and then I can carry on. And uh, there was a particularly cruel moment. I was in Wyoming, and it was snowing. Um, and I was so tired and I just thought I need to have a break. You know, I was trying to push on, like to go about another 15 miles before I stopped. And I just thought I need to stop. I need to eat. But if I stop, I'll get so cold. And I sat down like behind Pram Solo, like, trying to get out the worst of the wind, just like sort of eating like a, a Twix or some, some similar elite nutrition. And I was so cold by the time I finished it, but at least I was fed. <clears throat> And I'm going down the road, and about like 800 meters after that, I see a sign saying rest area. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And I go into it, it was a heated rest area. And I'd literally just sat there for like 45 minutes in the snow. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was in the, uh, like the toilets there, and I was just like having my hands and my head underneath the dryer. And like people coming in, just like having a wee on the way to like whatever they were driving to. And I was just thought, what is this hobo? Who's this? To, ha- who's know? this hairy man with a weird accent heating himself underneath exactly. the hair dryer? Yeah, I mean, like somebody um, needs to be told about this. <laughs> talk to me about what keeps you going, then, because I haven't heard you say at any point here that your desire to keep on going really started to wane. It seems like in the beginning you had a goal of getting yourself across to the Pacific, then from there it was, okay, well, let's do two crossings. Then from there, I guess as you break past halfway, it's more about finishing rather than continuing to do little bits. But, you know, telling somebody a story about running all of this way and then being on your own, hiding behind a fucking pram in the middle of the snow, like having lost five kilos from a bad hot dog. And like, what is it that got you up and kept you moving every single day was there a challenge psychologically to keep on going or is it just routine how did that work i sort of liken it a little bit like to a pyramid and the peak was the ultimate you know so uh, so, you know but you're very rarely at the peak you know and sort of uh, that has to be just an end goal so your day to day, you're always around the base of the pyramid. Now that would start with me being either in a motel room on somebody's couch or in my tent, you know, sort of uh, sometimes with my water bottles just frozen. And um, I, you know, I couldn't stay in that tent. What would I do? Like lie there all day at the side of the road, you know? So I had to get to somewhere else. So um, it's a bit like I, I call it like uh, like my tough boss. And it's a bit like, you know, on a Monday morning, you've had a great weekend but you're really tired and you do not want to go to work you can't just call up and say i'm not coming in because they'd be like why and they're like because i don't want to and they go well i don't want to pay you or employ you anymore you're fired and so you go in and then you do it and then to be honest a lot of the times when you go into work you go oh god i hate this and you're in there about now just go actually the people i work with are really nice and then someone will say something like you know oh thank you when you didn't expect it and you go this isn't so bad and I found I'd be like that every morning. I'd wake up, I'd be tired. I'd be like, there's no way I can run 40 miles today. But then I'd just go, well, you run 40 miles yesterday and the day before, so get up and do it, you know, you idiot. What are you going to do, lie here all day? You know, you've got, to, you've got to get to point B. You can't stay at point A. You can't afford to stay at point A for a start. 
So I would just, you know, sometimes it literally was as much as that. You know, if, if maybe if I had an extra 40 bucks in my pocket, I might have, I might have called it. But I was like, no, there is no option not to do this. So you just have to do it. Then the best thing you can do is to make it as fun as possible. So you would go, well, what are my good things going to be? And in the morning, you'd quite often hear a lot of nature before, like the world was too, like, you know, up and about. Um, then I would like get into music. Some days I would select certain artists. I had a rule that I could never walk when ACDC were playing. So if I ever selected ACDC for the morning, that was going to be a big morning. You know, I'd that dig me out of a hole. Like Bowie dug me out of a hole emotionally a few times. Nick Cave did as well. And then it'd be things like, well, it's only two hours to lunch, two hours and 10 miles. So get there. And I know that there's a particularly like good fast food joint there, you know, and if there's going to be air con and it's hot or it's going to be heating when it's cold. Uh, and then it'd be like, oh, it's going to be the end of the day soon. And I'm couch surfing tonight. So you'd, you'd go you know, stage to stage. And then suddenly you're like, in three days, I hit state line. So those three days would be golden because you'd be getting there. And then soon it'd be an ocean. Now, it's not just this relentless progress. Like people ask me if I ever wanted to quit and it there generally would have been probably after the first two legs, there would have been a thought almost every day, especially when I was on my own, you know, I just, there's no way I'm going to finish this. Let's jack it in. But I had two major reasons. We're getting to the top of the pyramid here now. And they were the two charities that I was running for. Um, and I, in the film, they asked Forrest, he's running across the Mississippi, such a central feature for my run and the film. Um, are you running for women's rights, the homeless, world peace, the environment and animals? And he gives the line, I just felt like running. Um, and so I did. I must have done. Uh, otherwise, I was in the wrong game. <laughs> um, but I wanted to get some charities that ticked all those boxes. And uh, so I chose the World Wildlife Fund, which does the environment and animals, and Peace Direct, which is a, a small charity. Uh, but it, they basically... Um, they do things like rescue child soldiers from the Congo, but provide them with homes and jobs afterwards. They empower women and educate women in Zimbabwe, a very traditional like macho society. And they basically just they bring peace. And, you know, in the truest sense of the word, not like absence of war, but peace has actually got a very different meaning. It's basically just being like at one and they allow families to be families. And it's just such a wonderful thing. And uh, the, the patron of Peace Direct is Mark Rylance, and so he was in Dunkirk, Bridge of Spies. And I got a video one day, and I just went to the RV, and I was just like, Nads, I think you need to look at this. And it was like a video from Mark Rylance just going, thank you for all you're doing, you know, in the pursuit of peace. And I just thought, Jesus Christ, man, if, like, someone like Mark is, is saying this about me, there's no way I can quit. And so my tough boss then wasn't just, you know, beast him. He was also an arm around my shoulder as well. You know, so he's an encouraging boss, and he would like sort of, you know, I, I would take sort of great solace in the things that went well, uh, rather than just going, oh, thank God, nothing bad happened today. I was just like, oh man, look, you've got from Tennessee into Virginia. This is brill. And um, the very top of the pyramid um, comes down to me being a bit of a mama's boy, just like Forrest. And this is my this is my mum, and she's not around anymore, unfortunately. Uh, she died when I was twenty three, um, and so she'd see me do a few marathons, and she'd see me like sort of uh, graduate from uni. But you know, she never saw B. She never saw any of the run. Uh, but she did give me one philosophical thing to hang my hat on, which was to do one thing in my life that made a difference, and. It's so transpired that all of these little sort of things came together, all these little pieces of the jigsaw. And it was when I was in the early stages of it, because I, I never really thought I would definitely do the Forest Gump run. And I didn't have those charities lined up. And then I just thought, this is just all too perfect. And I went, hang on, this is the thing I've maybe been subconsciously searching for for like 15 years. Let's try and make a difference. And there's one thing that will make you get out of bed, and that's not one to let your mum down, isn't it? So uh, wherever she was, I'm sure she could see me. And uh, I know that if she was there and if she was in the RV, and one day I was saying, I'm just going to sit off today, I'm not going to do it. She's just like, you're bloody not. Get out. I'll kick you out. <laughs> Man, that's <laughs> so beautiful. 
That's so such an awesome story. So talk me through reintegrating upon finishing. What were the emotions when you finished? And then how do you integrate back into a normal life in the UK? Yeah, like so I had like two finishes. So today, you know, one when I got to the distance and the only person that saw that was a friend of mine, Ben, who was doing some filming. Um, and so he's put together a really cool documentary that is, should hopefully see the the, uh, the light of day next year. And that was so personal because that was the one that that was the one for my mum because that's what I said I would do. I would do fifteen thousand two hundred forty eight miles, and I was in bits then actually saying this. Like, I'm on camera and just go, oh my god, I don't know what I'm going to be like at the proper end. But I realised that the end was going to be more of a celebration rather than anything else. And I knew the Dean and B were going to be there. I knew I had people who were coming, like my my school friend uh, who heard the creek. You know, so if he, he was coming over from San Francisco. Uh, people who I met in Alabama and South Carolina were coming out. And, of course, I had a very big surprise up my sleeve at the end. And so that was um, – it was all about making it perfect and just getting there. And I got to the exact point where, um, where Forrest finished, turned around, and I said the line. And then, of course, I go through the crowd and say, hey, guys, you should probably come and stick with me. Something cool is about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> don't get too close though and um i went and sought out nadine and um the only sort of reward i could give her in that sense was to thank her for everything that she'd done and for being so awesome because there's no way it wasn't even just the physical support she would have been completely within her rights and i offered as well completely within her rights to have said sorry mate you've got bigger fish to fry now you've got to come home you've got to do this you know and so uh but she said she would never have dreamt of it so i um i got down on one knee not just out of tiredness uh you know and uh and asked her to marry me and she fortunately said yes and fortunately i could get up afterwards and uh yeah it turned into a proper old celebration loads of the local navajo reservation i just i love the navajo so much it's just such a genuine people you know and they helped me so much in those last few days and then to have like my proposal at that point you know a very elaborate staged one but you know it just it just felt right you know sort of it felt like the right people were there you know and um yeah so we came back and normal life and i remember seeing a there's a there's a facebook group called usa crosses and it's about people who've like sort of a uh, uh, run or walked across the states and i remember seeing a post there saying how is everybody dealing with you know stuff after the run like i'm like really really struggling and i was reading this going oh that's interesting um well, well i said before about me feeling that I was bomb proof you know and i thought i'll be fine you know because uh, i'd you know changed jobs in the past i'd moved country i'd survived breakups and survived you know sort of, you know the deaths of like my, my closest family and i came through and i was fine i was just like no nah, it's not going to bother me of course i didn't post that because that'd be the act of a douchebag you know uh but i just thought what a shame these people are feeling like that and i was because my finish was so euphoric and because i had this lovely new baby and i thought oh we're going to be getting married you know um it took quite a while for me to realize i was in a really deep hole you know so i was really quite you know i, I turned into a grumpy heart bastard you know sort of, I, like, sort of you know where the, where a the joke would happen in the past i wouldn't respond in the same way and I realized it was, and I hated work even more, even though my new job was way better than my previous one. It was just this sense of like an ultimate freedom that I had on the run. And it wasn't there anymore. And like sort of, I didn't resent looking after my little girl. It's the best thing ever. But it was like one of these sort of things where physiologically, your body's just like, why aren't you doing this, man? <laughs> Where's the endorphins at? Exactly. And um, but the thing is, you go through that and like so the whole, you know, when they say, oh, when did your Olympic gold sink in? And they go, I don't think it has yet. And you just think, well, oh, a load of rubbish. You'd have, it would have sunk in the moment you were drinking that third bottle of champagne, you know? But it, it's really not like that. And I think sort of when you, it was just like when you experience a massive trauma, I think if you experience a massive like sort of high like that, it does take a while for everything to level off. And I'm so sort of happy that that's happened now. And um, uh I will be putting it behind me in a rather unique way in a few months, but uh, <laughs> we should probably get to that. What 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 can you tell us about that? So I am planning to go out to Monument Valley once again. Um, I am 
always wanted to run across America. And there's always been a thing that was just going because Forrest just finished in the middle of nowhere. And as you walk through the crowd, they're like, now what are we going to do? And I always thought about, you know, sort of what did he do after that? What did those people do? And I sort of want to go out and I want to I want to see the people sort of in Cayento, sort of my Navajo friends, you know. I want to run to that ocean one last time. And sort of, a, I think it would have to be in Santa Monica because if you're a fan of the film, uh, you'll notice at the start a single white feather floats into the scene and at the end it floats out. And I just reached my uh, first ocean in Santa Monica and Chris Finnell, the fellow uh, runner, said it doesn't count unless you get in the sea. So uh, I stripped off. It was the November the 30th. You know, it's almost five years, like to the day that we're talking. And I um, got in. It was freezing cold. And um, I came out and I was just put my clothes on. I was just like, who put that there? And underneath my Nike Cortez was a single white feather that nobody had done. Everyone's just, I literally had just blown in there. And I was just like, this is so Truman show tastic. It's unbelievable. And so, um, yeah, I think sort of that would be the way that I'll get a nice sense of closure. Um, I've obviously discussed it in depth with Nadine and I'm hoping to persuade her to come out because I do think sort of, uh, I think Disney World will definitely be on the cards with it, <laughs> with our little and now. Uh, but obviously I'll be doing it in a bit of a, in a different way this time. I, I don't think I'm going to be um, pushing it as hard on the miles. I'm not going to be running at night unless I'm in the desert in the middle of nowhere. You know, I always actually wanted to have one night where I just ran through the desert, you know, start running at sunset and see a sunrise um, and then just get there and see the ocean. And instead of turning around this time, just go for a slap up dinner. <laughs> Man. And then what about Australia? Have you got any intentions to do anything over there? Oh, that that's a that's a big burning thing. Like stuff like um focused on America at the moment. I I one of one of the things I do want to do is obviously, you know, it's another opportunity to try and raise a shed load of money for Peace Direct and WWF as well. But talk about WWF Australia, it's like, you know, it's almost climate change in a in a just a microcosm is it from the barrier reef through the fires through the droughts and they would work very well you know sort of over there you know to try and see those landscapes and i felt so at home in australia like sort of i you know i can say i'm australian champion and that makes me australian like even if it's not by birth you know like i'm really quite proud adopted of son and yeah exactly and um I think only one person's ever gone um, the whole way across from the most eastern point to the so the most western point to the most eastern point, and um, I think I wouldn't mind. But yeah, I'm quite happy being the second one there. Fuck. Well, I mean, the outback's going to be significantly more remote than even the most remote place in America, right? You've just got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles with absolutely nothing. Yeah, like the, the most remote point, the place I was in was with Wyoming. And basically you were looking at like sort of um, 40 miles was the, sort of the, you know, the minimum really before you get anything like a gas station. But yeah, there's a, a single road in Australia that is 93 miles long, absolutely straight. And if it wasn't for the curvature of the earth, if you shone a laser pointer at one end, you would see it at the other end. And so... Uh, I want to do that road in one day. That's going to be a thing. That's pretty, I just that's pretty get, hardcore. Yeah. I, I, I want to draw a little line at the start myself. But if I've got a crew, I want them to go. And you know, like when you get to the end of a Formula One track and they've got the little checkered flag on the end, I just want that there. And <laughs> Man, we'll Australian, gum. The Australian gum. Australian gum. I'm all about it. <laughs> with, instead of the uh, Bubba Gump hat, it's going to have to be one of those little sort of, uh, you know, the hats with the cork, with the cork so. hanging down. Yeah, there's, us, there's Australian yeah. people feeling like we're appropriating their culture at the moment. But I'm man, allowed I'm, to, man. I'm Australian champion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'm allowed to do it. Uh, Rob, tell people where they can go to watch and learn more about this. It's such an amazing story. And the Audible book with your uh, beautiful Scouse accent adding an extra bit of color to it must be amazing. Exactly. As I said, because it is generally, at the end of the day, this is a love story. It's love for the film. It's love for Nadine and B. But it's also a love letter to the people of America and the country. It's not about making America great again. It's about stopping America going down the tubes because America has got infinite potential. It always has and it always will be. 
we just got to stop this narrative that, you know, everything's bad. Yeah, it's got problems. We've all got problems, but America's got it to solve. And so, yeah, it's all about love. And uh, we need more of that in the world. And this is uh, this is the Becoming Forest, the book. Uh, it's out in all your shops. Uh, it's out in Australia and New Zealand, I think, on January the 5th and out in America on February the 8th. But, you know, you can, if you're desperate, you can get it from alternative bandit sources now. <laughs> Man. And what about if people want to keep up to date with you? Websites, socials, all that? Yeah. So um, like Run Forest Run, I'm Run Rob La Run. So R-O-B-L-A. And I'm on I'm on most things. I'm not, I'm not doing the old TikTok yet, but I think if I do go back uh, to the States in February, I think I'll probably have to dip my toes in that water. <laughs> You're going to need a translator for the people on TikTok to understand. <laughs> maybe i'll just lip sync the songs man i've heard that's all the rage just do a dance dude this has been <laughs> yeah. this has been really really amazing i love the story i love what you've done i love the fact that it had a higher purpose it seems like it's been the keystone moment that so much of your life before and after a little bit of closure and then a genesis for something new i think it's a really really beautiful story man i'm really excited to see what you do next thanks very much mate thanks for letting me tell it my pleasure What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.